the 67 Figure Show, episode 91. Let's hit it. Broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun outside Phoenix, Arizona, this is the 6 to 7 Figure Show. Tired of working so hard and having no time? Take your six-figure practice and turn it to a thriving seven-figure enterprise. And now, your host, author, speaker, mentor, and strategist, Frank Bria. Hey everyone, welcome to the Six to Seven Figure Show. I'm your host, Frank Bria, and in today's episode, we are going to talk about executive coaching. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. This episode of the Six to Seven Figure Show is brought to you by High Ticket Program. Did you know you're only 12 projects away from turning your six figure practice into a thriving seven figure enterprise? In the High Ticket Program Accelerator, we guide you through every step of growth and scale in a process we call LEAP. Imagine having a world-class project team guiding you and your team through each and every step of pain-free growth, all with the goal of becoming a seven-figure enterprise and moving away from painful, time-consuming business operations and client delivery. Get a taste of Leap in your own business by downloading our free high-ticket program, Core Offer Blackbook, that contains more than 60 pages of standard operating procedures for your business, including onboarding, customer service, graduation, financial management, and a lot more. You can get this for free by going to the show's homepage, 6to7.show. That's 6to7.show for your free black book. I am absolutely pleased to be introducing today's guest, Brandon Smith. He is a leading expert in leadership, communication, and curer of workplace dysfunction. Known as the workplace therapist and host of the Brandon Smith podcast, Brandon is a sought-after executive coach, TEDx speaker, an award-winning instructor. He's the founder of the WorkSmiths LLC, an executive coaching and leadership development firm whose clients include numerous Fortune 500 companies. Brandon, welcome to the show. Yeah, Frank, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be on the other side of the camera for once. Yeah, it's, really nice. it's always it's always <laughs> fun interviewing other podcast hosts, right? Because then they yeah. it's a little bit like uh, they're they're judging me, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's like I, now, I, now I just get to sit back and relax and answer the questions, which no, is that's great. great. <laughs> that's great. Um, so first of all, I want to start off with this, this moniker of yours, the workplace therapist, which when I first saw, I kind of had a little sort of internal chuckle uh, because I have been in so many workplaces where I felt like that's exactly what they needed was a therapist to come in. Yeah. In fact, in one of the startups I was in, they literally hired a marriage counselor to work with the executive team because it was so dysfunctional and it was causing serious issues. But let's talk about that. Like, is there, are, are there dynamics that are changing in organizations right now that are requiring more of this, uh, I guess, soft skills uh, perspective in getting the teams to work together better? Uh, absolutely. Totally. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of organization we're, we're, we're talking about. Startups, big companies, uh, nonprofits, uh, schools. I mean, it doesn't matter. They've all got issues. So there's, there's two big factors that are at play for us. And it's true for all workplaces right now. Uh, first, uh, time is everyone's most precious resource. Not money, it's time. Right? That's a lot of why your listeners are hired, right? It's like, come fix our problems for us. We don't have time to do it ourselves. Uh, and second, everything is urgent all the time. And so when everything's urgent all the time and time's our most precious resource, when we start moving in that world, uh, we step on lots of toes. We throw lots of elbows. And we don't talk as much to each other. And so it causes a, that, that pace of business causes so many more people-related dynamics. So even if I'm, well, we'll get into my hats in a little bit, but one of my hats is I work with leadership teams. And it doesn't matter what kind of leadership team I work with, they've all got the same issue, alignment. Alignment is the number one issue. Yeah. Like they may be great individual players or great re leading their respective areas, but they're not talking to each other. So yeah, at a fundamental level, it's like any therapist, right? Or, or marriage counselor, communication folks, right? We got, right. You, have to, you have to talk to each other, talk about expectations and needs and clarify that stuff. So that, that's the long answer to your question, absolutely. I mean, and I, I'm seeing it get worse, mostly because of the pace of change and even the role technology plays in that. Yeah, I'd imagine, um, you know, all of the issues around um, communication have become much more complex as um, we're communicating with each other in lots of different ways than we did before. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I know from my own personal experience, because I'm not great at this either, 
um, different, uh, you know, different communication vehicles, whether it's email or instant messaging or a video conference or face-to-face, -face, they have slightly different dynamics and, and we're all, it's not totally. like we were born with a manual about how to, how to adapt our communication to these different vehicles and they're changing and the expectations are changing really fast. Yeah, and people have different preferences. Right. You know, so I, I, sent, I sent a Word doc to a client of mine yesterday. He works for an organization that is uh, about 200 employees. Uh, they're going to be at closer to 350 next year, and it's all virtual. So there's no two people in the same office. They all work out of their homes all over the globe. Yeah. So I sent him a document to it for us to review, and he, and, and he was confused. He was like, wait a minute. This is a Word document? I thought you were going to you know, put it in like a, some kind of a Google Drive so you know, we could, we could kind of manipulate it together. Uh, just everyone has different expectations of how stuff is right. being sent to them and shared to them and communicated with them. And so that right. also makes it tricky. Yeah, it, it definitely has got more complicated. I mean, when, when I first started, uh, you know, there was always the, uh, well, this person likes voicemail and this person likes, you know, whatever, <laughs> but now it is way more yep. complicated. We're, we're talking about like uh, collaboration <laughs> uh, between documents and things yeah. like that. Um, so as you were getting in and uh, working with these companies, what are some of the biggest barriers you're finding uh, for people to not communicate? Like what, why are they misaligned? Why are they having such a difficult time doing this on their own? So generally speaking, they're just not taking the time to do it. So, you know, we think about that challenge of leadership. It's like striking that perfect balance of being efficient and effective. Yeah. Like we got to be both efficient, speed, and effective quality. And we all know that intuitively. But when we live in the world I just described, where time's our most precious resource and everything's urgent, it's like we, we trade off effectiveness for efficiency. And people are just going too fast. Yeah. So it's not, that, um, it's not that they're bad. It's not that we're bad people. It's just that we're not, we're not being intentional about it. So simple things like, you know, all the studies show that you should be giving five positive for every one piece of negative feedback. And that goes on all my action plans of all my clients. Yeah. And they are all good people, but none of them are doing it right. because they don't, they don't prioritize it. So, um, you, you know, communication is just not uh, a priority and that's what's causing all the issues. And so it's about, it's about how do we intentionally, you know, put it on our calendars and make it more of a, a priority. Yeah. Do, do you find there's ever pushback around trade-offs. I feel like, you know, anytime there's a discussion around prioritization and time, there's this immediate sort of thing that comes up in us that it's like, I don't have time to do that. Like that, of course, in a perfect world, that would be amazing. But why doesn't everyone just grow up and figure this out? Like we don't have time for that sort of thing. Do you, I, that, that seemed to be kind of an old style reaction or pushback to a lot of this. Uh, are you still seeing that? Yeah. Uh, a little bit, but it, uh, it depends a lot on the, um, the level in which someone's in an organization. So let's take a traditional company, okay? So, um, and then I'm gonna give some caveats to this. So we'll call it a traditional company. Um, my experience has been once a company hits 3 billion in revenue with a B, mm -hmm. it ceases to become a company and it morphs into a government. Um, so we can, we can, whether we talk about our government companies, which really aren't companies at all, they're run right. by politics, or right. we can talk about smaller ones. My experience has been, you can hold that mentality of not really needing to worry about aligning if you're up to about senior manager. Once you hit director, that's the difference between a director and a manager. Mm. Politics start at the director level. Mm. So that's when you, you really, you can't have that orientation of, well, I'm just doing my work and not worrying about the person to my left and right. You just, problems happen. Product doesn't talk to marketing or whatever, and then the, the issues break down. Uh, so when the scale's smaller, um, it, you can you don't have to, but when it gets bigger, it becomes a necessity. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I love that dynamic. The basically becoming a government. The it is it is interesting that um, I think the, you know relationship complexity. A lot of people would think you know it kind of grows linearly, right? As the number of people grow, it, but, but we have to draw lines between all the different people in the organization. And so when you add another person, you're not just adding one more line of communication, you're adding one for every other person that's in the company. And for us mathematicians, that's exponential growth, which means it gets ugly yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, so talk to us a little bit about your path into this. Um, so, for those people who have looked at leadership uh, work or leadership coaching or executive coaching, 
um, and working with corporations. What, what was your path into getting started into this? So I'll, I'll show you, I'll share with you the short spark story for me. Okay. So, um, I, I undergraduate degree uh, was in communications. So like most good communication majors, I was unemployed at graduation, <laughs> wondering what am I going to do with this thing? And I got a job with a small chain of retail stores. It was a family owned business and it was privately held family owned. They had 15 stores. Okay? And my boss was the son-in-law of the business. So the woman who started the business, her daughter marries this guy. He's my boss. So he greets me at the first day of work. Now, so I'm 22 years old and I'm, you know, working my first, I've worked lots of other jobs, but this is my first full-time job. He greets me at the door of the store and he says, I'm so excited you're here. You're going to be the assistant manager. But before you get started, I have a task for you. Waiting for you in the back room is the current assistant manager, but he doesn't know you're coming. Your job is to go back there, fire him, you get his job. And that was how my boss rolled. He'd come in and he'd say, he loves surprise visits. He loved doing everything that leaders are not supposed to do, like oh, shocking wow. people, surprise visits. You know, he'd come in and he'd say, I don't like what Sandra's wearing. Go fire her. So I had to do more layoffs in the first six months of that job than any other time in my career. Oh, wow. And that experience kind of woke me up and made me realize a couple things. It made me realize, first, work should not have to suck. <laughs> it should be the source of fulfillment and meaning and purpose for us. You know, it's not that all the time, but it should be that. Yeah. And not anxiety and depression and all that other stuff that bad leaders can create. Um, it was it also made me realize that if my boss was any indication of the state of leadership, we needed to fix that in a pretty desperate way. Uh, and that was where my life purpose was born, that I wanted to cure all workplace dysfunction everywhere forever, having no idea what I had signed up for. <laughs> so I said, all right, if, if I want to do this, how am I going to do this? So here I am, 22 years old and trying to figure out that path. Now, was some time ago, as you can tell by my white, my white hair. Um, and so I said, all right, well, I'm going to go back and get a clinical therapy degree first. Because back then, there was an executive coaching certificate. Yeah. That wasn't a common thing. So I went off and I got a clinical therapy degree, practiced inpatient for just a number of years. Then I transitioned to the corporate world because I knew I needed corporate experience. Did that for a number of years. Uh, went back and got my MBA and then um, had an offer to join a traditional consulting firm doing human capital work. And uh, really thought long and hard about that um, and then turned that down and said, you know, um, uh, the analogy that kind of came to my mind was, you know, um, my ship wasn't quite built. I had holes in the bottom of the ship, but the weather was never going to be better to set sail. Yeah. So I figured, you know, set sail and I'll figure it out on, on the way. And uh, that was about 15 years ago. Wow. So uh, that's that's that was my journey. So, you know, yeah, kind of nice. clinical and that and that business. Those are my kind of Reese's peanut butter cup. You know, components. <laughs> but but always driven by this it sounds like early on you set this uh this goal this this mission for yourself which drove yeah. uh each of the steps along the way that that's absolutely fascinating so, so i want to pivot a little bit to talk about your business itself um yeah one i know a lot of listeners uh when they want to do work in leadership or even some of these softer skills and teams one of the difficult things they have a hard time with is, um, is really talking to that prospect and helping them recognize that they actually need the help. In other words, they, 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 they sense a problem. A lot of organizations have a hard time sort of recognizing, okay, we need leadership. We need, you know, to, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation for some of them to have. Um, how do you do that work of, helping your organizations recognize the pain, recognize that you have a solution to that pain and make yourself the choice, uh, to the go-to person for this. Okay. So, um, in some ways it's easy for me now because most of my work is all referral. Yeah. So it all, and that's in this world is a referral world. I mean, this really is so referral. Yeah. Um, because, because people are coming with an issue or a problem that they don't always want to publicly promote. Sure. You know, a very yes. well prestigious nonprofit that everyone knows. They don't want to show everyone that their leadership team is completely a dysfunctional mess. Right. right. Um, and, but, but they really need that help. So uh, a lot of it is referral based. Now, that being said, for your, for your listeners, it's important for them to distinguish uh, a couple things. First, am I a consultant or am I a practitioner? Yeah. And those are two different things. Okay, so a consultant is going to advise them on what they need to do. A practitioner is going to fix the problem for them. 
Right. And so that's different. So I, I'm, I'm more of a, a pro, I'm a practitioner. So I, while we talk about my business, really it's a practice. Yeah. I, I'm there to do that. Right. The other thing is I would also strongly advise folks listening, um, come in with more than one solution. Don't, uh, don't say one. So I've got executive coaching. I've got three solutions. Executive coaching, so I can work one-on-one. I can do team retreats. I can work with the whole team. Or I can do leadership workshops, which is kind of increase, improve everybody's toolkits, right? So I can work with all 50 of your leaders, this group of five, or, or one-on-one. And any combination of those, depending upon the, uh, where the pain point is. Mm-hmm. Is it more of a global pain point? We, all of our leaders need to get better? Or is it more of a specific, no, we've got this one leader. And she or he's causing lots of issues. Can you can you make them play nice in the sandbox? Right. So I think having multiple ways to solve a problem is really important. And then the other thing that I would say is, you know, um, the key for me is that initial conversation. Mm. So I'm asking a lot of questions. So I always bring my crystal ball and my magic wand to those conversations. So my crystal ball is, all right, let's say it's six months from now and I'm done my work with you and it's success. What would that look like? What yeah. would perfect look like? Yeah. And then a uh, magic wand is if you could wave anything or fix anything around here, what would you fix? What was, what's the one big pain point that is, that is an issue for you? Or what would you not want to see happen in six months? Yeah. So the needs conversation is really important so I can know how to scope the work properly. Right. Um, yeah, so that, a couple of different ways to answer your question. No, no, that's great. And, and that assessment piece at the beginning that you're talking about, I agree, critically important, and um, that you're asking lots of questions and you're listening and gathering that information. A lot of people, I think, make the mistake of going into an initial meeting and presentation and, and, and making it all about them. You know, start off with yeah. a presentation of their background and their great work and their last case studies and things like that, where it, it doesn't become about the potential client, the prospect, and what they need. So that's great advice. Um, the the work that you do must involve some sensitive change in people's lives occasionally, right? Getting them out yeah. of their uh, old habits and getting them into new ones. Uh, and that seems to be a common thread for a lot of people in their businesses. Um, how do you find the, the, the process of getting people to recognize and take action to make change? How, is that, uh, how has that become a part of your work? Oh, it's uh, critically important, critically important. And I would say that where it becomes the most important is if we kind of look across the, that stream of examples I gave you, the macro to the micro, it's the yeah. most important on the micro level because I've been asked to come in and work with a particular leader and the goal is get them to play nicer in the sandbox. <laughs> so it's always the same story. They're technically very smart, very competent, but they're thrown too many elbows, stepping on too many toes, yeah. causing issues. Uh, and I got to get that person to see that there's a problem and then, and then recognize they need to change. And so there's two parts to that process. The first part is uh, 360 interviews. So while there's a lot of tools out there that folks can use, whether it's Disc Profile or Berkman or Myers-Briggs or you name it, yeah. nothing beats old school 360 interviews when it, when it comes to people change. So I will interview 15 to 20 people and then present a feedback report that's all verbatim to that client, mm. basically just spelling it out. Here's what people are saying about you. Yeah. Here's what it's costing you. And here's what you need to change and what success could look like. And um, so very practically, that conversation is about two hours and they go through all stages of grief in that two hours. I bet. <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's always one comment in there that gets under their skin. And I can never predict which one it is, but there's always one. Um, and that's part of that process. They, they need to have that feeling of, of pain in order to stimulate change. Um, and I had a client of mine tell me several years ago, I need a light of fire uh, in my people, but sometimes I need a light of fire under them too. Sure. And that's, that's part of my job as a coach is to light a fire under them and in them too. So once we go through that 360 interview process and I deliver that feedback, then I create the action plan that is very practical, actionable, and that's what we work off of to drive change. Uh, and overall, when I work with the clients, it's typically six months. It's a okay. six-month kind of project fee engagement because that's yeah. about how long it takes to get people to not only change but then sustain the change. Sustain it and then, and then obviously sort of start to see the fruits of that change, which is going to help stick it 
you know, have, help that become part of their, their process on an ongoing basis, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to go back to something you had said, which is fascinating. The, uh, that there is pain, pain is the thing that's breeding the change. Because I do think a lot of people feel like, especially in corporate environments, that it's good enough to sort of paint this picture of where we want to go and that that's enough to motivate people. And sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes there needs to be, uh, you know, the, the, the pain needs to be strong enough to get people to take action because the action in and of itself is kind of painful. So it's almost like you have to choose between the pain of change or the pain of the present. And if there isn't enough pain, people are going to go for the, the easiest path, I suspect. Yeah. So, so this kind of goes to this idea of how do you create urgency with a client? Mm -hmm. um, and there's two kinds of urgency. There's best case scenario and worst case scenario. Mm. Um, and some clients respond better to one than the other. Yeah. So, so to help your listeners, if you're dealing with anyone that is in a risk management profession, so our folks in legal, compliance, HR, um, anything that's kind of risk management, they only respond to pain. Right. Because they are wired to just seek out and destroy all risk and pain. Right. That's right. what motivates them. Yep. If we're dealing with our friends in sales, they don't want to hear about like horrible, bad things that could happen to them. They want to hear about how they can get more money and how great things can happen. So they have to be motivated by best case scenario. Yeah. And if you don't know which one to use, use them both. That's great. You know? and, and a lot of times when you're dealing with corporations and you're trying to land a contract with a corporation, you're dealing with multiple people. So you might have to be telling yeah. multiple stories uh, at the organizational level to get different people to sign off. Um, I know you've got Fortune 500 experience. That's been in my background too. And I'm almost never selling to one person to get a Fortune 500 company to, to sign off on something. There's, there's always someone who, you know, what, one person might sign the check, but as we like to joke, um, there's a lot of people who can't say yes, but they can say no. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you see that as well. Yep. Um, uh, one last question, because I want to I drive back into this as sort of like the final exam communication question. <laughs> what did you say to the manager you fired? <laughs> How did you walk oh, in as the brand new person and deliver the news that they were fired when you had no, no authority or credibility with that person as their boss? That to me feels like the final exam of leadership and communication. <laughs> Oh, Frank, you know, I just went in and I was very honest and transparent. I said, you don't know me. My name's Brandon. I've just been given the assistant manager of this store, this job. And I was told that that's no longer going to be your job. Um, <laughs> and we talked a little bit, but you know, what's funny was, you know, he had worked for this boss long enough that it was not a surprise. Okay. He just, he just, you, know, you could see immediately the look on his face. He was like, I knew he was going to do this. And he just packed up his stuff and left. Wow. Uh, no, that's, but yeah, you know, I, that, that, I think that, that's the trick. It does see. feel like it would be like the the worst case scenario anyone would be dealing with from a communication perspective. But uh, that's your yeah. first first task on the first day on the job. Uh, Brandon, thanks so much. This has been really uh, a pleasure talking with yeah. you. It's been it's been great. Uh, I you've been really gracious with your time, and I don't want to overstay our welcome. But um, last question, uh, last thing before we go, is the audience as listening to you, uh, they want to learn a little bit more about what you do and connected with you. What's a great way for them to connect with you? Yeah, there's really two ways. So I break some rules. Um, I have two different websites. And okay. so while, while one is uh, my B2C website, that's my workplace therapist website. So if you Google the workplace therapist, there's only one, there's me. So you'll find me. And that, all, that site's got my blog, my podcast, and free resources that are just to help you make your workplaces better. My other site is my B2B site. That's called The Worksmiths, just like Blacksmiths, but The Worksmiths. And that's where um, if people want to hire me for my services, that's where I put all of my um, service-facing side of me. Um, so they, they can find me either way. And, of course, on LinkedIn and reach out and connect. I'm always happy to do that too. Great. Well, we'll put those links. They're here below the video. They're on the show notes page for if you're listening to audio. If you're out and about listening to this broadcast, come on back to the show notes page and um, – We'll get you connected. Uh, just you can click on through. Brandon, thanks so much for being with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Frank, my pleasure. I really appreciate uh, coming on your show and thanks for having me. You got it. 
And thank you for being with us on the Six to Seven Figure Show. I've been your host, Frank Bria. Just a quick reminder about the free high ticket program core for Black Book. Contains more than 60 pages of standard operating procedures on how to run your coaching, consulting, or expert based service business. You can download that for free at the show's homepage, six to seven dot show. That is six to seven dot show for your free Black Book. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Six to Seven Figure Show. Thank you.